Hi, I'm Bob Hockmuth, County Agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension. We're here at the Suwannee Valley Agricultural Extension Center and we're going to take the information that we have gathered from all of the various pest management strategies that we've deployed here on the farm and we're going to have one final scouting activity in our crop to determine the final benefits of all of the activities together. Hi Susan, what are you looking for? Hi Bob, I'm scouting for insects in these squash. This is Dr. Susan Webb, Extension Specialist in Vegetable Entomology in the Department of Entomology and Nematology at the University of Florida. You know Susan, we kind of come down to the end here in the scouting part of the program where we're able to determine the benefit of all the different strategies that we've implemented here on our farm utilizing a whole farm integrated pest management approach. What are some of the goals that we're looking for in a scouting program? Well, primarily a scouting program is to get a good enough estimate of the numbers of insects, diseases, beneficial insects in order to make management decisions so we don't use pesticides any more often than we have to. Because insects are not evenly distributed, you have to get out into the field to see what's going on. For some crops, like tomatoes, we have very specific guidelines on how to do that. They recommend a six-foot section of tomatoes every two acres throughout the field. But for some crops, like squash, we don't have that information. But there are general methods of sampling, and one way is to decide on a path through the field and then stop at certain locations along that path. I like using a W. It gets you in and out of the field on the same side of the field and it takes you from the edges to the interior and you need to sample in both because there can be differences. So the guidelines say one location for every two to two and a half acres. So for a 40 acre field, 20 locations. But if you have a smaller field, you almost really have to still do 20 because below a certain number, your estimates get pretty shaky. So at each location then, you want to look at one to five plants. Or if it's a crop where you can't distinguish the plants very easily, like you can in squash, a section of row, say a three foot section of row or a six foot like tomatoes. And I always carry some bags um, with me to collect samples of things that I'm not sure about. So I can take those then to um, someone who does. So in addition to the bags that you would take to the field when you do the collecting, what are some of the other tools that you might have with you when you enter into the field for your scouting exercise? Well, there are some different tools. Not all of them are useful in every crop and for every insect. For example, sweep nets can be very useful for fast-moving insects like leafhoppers and sturdy crops like snap beans, where you're not going to damage the crop by sweeping through it. Another thing that's often used in snap beans is a beet cloth. It's a, basically a heavy piece of canvas that's light in color that you lay down between the rows. It's a defined area, maybe three feet by three feet. Then you shake those plants over the cloth and whatever falls out, you count. But for something like squash, it's a little bit too, too tender to do that. So the, the real useful method for vegetables is a leaf turn count. Insects tend to live on the underside of leaves. So just turning the leaf over slowly and counting what's there can give you the best estimates. For some plants, you may have to look at the entire plant until you have a good idea of where those insects are likely to be, and then maybe you can then limit your sampling to a specific part of the plant so you don't have to look at the entire plant. It helps to have a hand lens. They, these come in different magnifications. They help you see really tiny insects um, like mites and maybe immature white flies. You have to get them pretty close to your eye to see, to get things in focus, but they're very helpful. Finally, other kinds of monitoring tools include traps, like sticky traps and pheromone traps, which we already have talked about in another segment. And I know that some of those on the leaf turn method for 
cro a crop like squash, we're really looking for things like white flies and aphids. I know those are two very important ones, so we would primarily be utilizing that leaf turn method here. When we make our counts, I know you have a clipboard present with you there, and I'm assuming that we're going to try to record some of that information so that we can go back at the end of the scouting exercise and try to make some sense of what we've, what we've discovered in the field. Tell us a little bit about the kind of data that you would want to collect. Bob, the, it will depend on um, your, what you're trying to do. Some information is going to be common to any situation. I always put the date, the time of day, what field it is if I'm doing multiple locations, what crop it is, if I know the variety, that's helpful. The growth stage is important because younger plants may be more vulnerable than older plants to certain pests. And then I usually have, you can either do this down the side or across the top, a number for the location that I'm sampling, and then on the other axis, the specific pests that I'm most interested in, um, that I know from prior knowledge of what's a problem in a crop. For here, I would have aphids and whiteflies, as you mentioned, but also pickle worm, melon worm, two of our caterpillar pests, and perhaps squash bug, which has been a problem in recent years. And I also leave a column for beneficial insects so I can make a note if there's a lot of beneficials there. Then you can total and average those counts. If there are thresholds available, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, then you can use those numbers directly to make a decision on whether you need to treat. Otherwise, you can plot those numbers over time from week to week and use that information. Is the population going up? Is it going down? Is it staying the same? And that can help you make a decision. If you have lots and lots of insects, the first 10 plants you look at, you're pretty much likely going to have to do something about it. And if you find very few, then you can probably relax. But it's that in-between that's a little trickier to judge. So in that situation, we're really trying to identify maybe what the threshold is uh, where below a certain uh, level of pest, we're maybe not going to have to worry about it necessarily. And then at some point, we're going to have to probably take some type of action. And uh, I think you're describing that as the threshold, if, you, if you'd like to describe that just a little bit more. Thresholds have been around a long time. They're very difficult, really, to, to develop. It takes a lot of research. What we're most interested in is an action threshold, where that's the point where the yield loss or damage will exceed the cost of controlling the problem if you don't do anything at that point. So we have those kinds of thresholds for some crops, like tomatoes, where there's been a lot of work done. We know, for example, in tomatoes, if you have one tomato fruit worm for six plants before there's fruit, that's where your threshold is. When you have fruit, you don't want any, basically. You find one in your field and you have to do something because they attack the part that you're selling and they just show up in, in large numbers. But in a lot of cases, we don't have thresholds. So you have to use your experience um, and your information that you've gathered through scouting to kind of develop your own threshold of what you can tolerate um, and what seems to make the most sense. So, so there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. So determining the action threshold really is a pretty complicated measure and even the price of the product going into the marketplace would also have a role in determining whether we're going to take some action or, or not. So uh, that, that's a really important piece of the, uh, of the puzzle here. I know from experience over the last few years when we've been working together on this project, the scouting part of the program has allowed us to reduce the number of sprays that we would have utilized in this field by at least half. So we, we not only have reduced the number of applications, but we've also made some sensible uh, choices of what material we're going to apply if we have to apply any at all. So uh, we want to make some smart decisions. What are some of the things that guide us into those maybe better or smarter decisions if we do have to apply a material? Let me just talk a little bit about those things that go on at the beginning of the season, the soil applied insecticides. Even then, you're 
previous history of the crop and the time of year may lead you to say, okay, I know we're going to have a big problem with white flies. I'm going to put this material on at planting, and then I don't have to worry about it for six weeks. Now, with other materials, though, you do have to make decisions during the season, and there's mo that's a lot of them. The identification of your pest is probably the primary piece of information you have to have first. A lot of our materials now are only effective against certain types of pests, so you want to choose the material that's going to work best for the pests that you have. The second thing is, are your plants flowering? Like this squash is full of flowers, and I'm sure in the morning you have lots of bees coming in to pollinate. We have a lot of insecticides that are very harmful to bees. So you really want to stick with materials that are fairly mild. Insect growth regulators, which affect a number of our pests like white flies, um, are not so harmful to bees. Another piece is the pre-harvest interval. How these squash now are being harvested, there's actually fruit on these plants. So if you're going to spray them, you want something that maybe has a one day to harvest um, restriction or zero days because if you have a material that says you have to wait seven days between the time you apply it and the time you harvest, you, you would be in trouble. You would have lost your crop. And then another um, aspect that's related to managing the development of resistance to insecticides is how many times can you apply that material? So maybe you've used one of these products all, twice already, and the label says, you know, maximum of three applications per season. You almost have to kind of have all that information in front of you to know what you can rotate with, what kinds of products you can shift to. Knowing the mode of action is important, and we include that mode of action um, code now in our vegetable production handbook tables and it's on the label and so the idea is that if you use products with the same mode of action repeatedly you will get insecticide resistance so you want to alternate with materials with different modes of action and that's true for fungicides as well they have um, their own codes uh, for what materials you need to not use one after the other. So that sounds like a lot of information that we need to input into the system to come up with a, the best answer for what we want to try to accomplish on our farm for that week. And uh, the scouting exercise itself has been extremely helpful in us not applying any of the pesticides unnecessarily. And in addition to that, we've been working really hard on other parts of the farm to build up our beneficial uh, insect population to let some of the good guys come in here and do some work for us that maybe we don't have to spray. And we certainly don't want to eliminate all the hard work that we've done in some of our other strategies by choosing the wrong insecticide for a particular pest, uh, pest situation. So all of that goes into is not a simple decision, is it? It's a no, lot of information. No, and we've just touched the surface here. <laughs> yep. So it's not easy. Yep. So the scouting exercise puts together all that information into one final sort of a weekly uh, basis, maybe even more frequently than, and, than that at certain times. But on a weekly basis, we put all that information together and determine if we have reached an action threshold. And if so, then we need to make a correct choice in terms of applying a pesticide for a given pest. Susan, you've made a really great impact on helping us to learn how to put this part of the program together here and have made a real positive impact on this farm. And I think that many of our small farmers and midsize and large farmers can also benefit from the same kind of procedure. So thank you very much for helping us with learning how to do the scouting exercise. You're very welcome.